good morning, evening, afternoon, whenever you're watching this. Uh, God has good things, and uh, praise God for that. And for the opportunity we have to talk about who He is and, and what He has for us. We're continuing to look, uh, it's actually probably our last, uh, Sunday School for Zechariah, um, the dreams that he had, and, and visions, and uh, some explanation there. And, and um, so we're in chapter 3 this week, and uh, that is again one of those places where uh, God continues to show up and kind of drop some little hints about the Messiah who's coming uh, who's gonna be Jesus and uh, so it's good stuff so let's pray and then we'll begin thank you God so much for opportunities to look at your word I thank you for your truth and the hope that it is for us I, I thank you God for how you walk with us and uh, we don't deserve that and yet you do um, thank you God for what you want to do inside of us and help us dear Lord to to fully say hey it's all about you God help us to to make it about you um, thank you God for your goodness and your faithfulness um, be with us now as we look at your word in your name we pray amen and that really is I'm just gonna move this slightly this way uh, and that really is um, the important thing for us to do is we look at Sunday school is that education thing and and uh, I just did uh, yesterday well I guess we on Friday, uh, I just did uh, some primary source documents with, with some of my students. And it's that looking back, and it's nice for us to read about history, um, but when we actually look at what the things were that were written or pictures that were taken during that time period, that is where really things start to come alive. And that's um, so important for us uh, to be able to do. And so it's so important for any Bible study, uh, any, any devotional thing to be looking at God's Word. And so there are a couple passages I'm going to read today. Um, and you say, man, that might be a longer section here, but I, I want you to understand the context. And I also want to understand that, that as we're looking at this, these truths, God's word is the foundation. Uh, it, it's not about platitudes. It's not about other things. It needs to be God's word. And so if you are finding yourself, one of the things I make my students do is they do uh, sermon notes on, uh, on for my Bible class. Uh, they have to say, like, okay, what are the scriptures that are being used in the sermon? And if there aren't scriptures being used, I say, you got to watch something else then. you got to find something that is using God's word as a launching point. Because otherwise, um, we're just listening to nice thoughts. And so we, we need to get to God's word. So anyway, today uh, we're looking first here at um, Zechariah chapter 3. And uh, I'll read it to you. Uh, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Uh, is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood there before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. And they said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, Put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in obedience with me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house, have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place among the, these standing here. Listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you, uh, who are men of symbolic things to come. I'm going to bring my servant, the branch, capital B. See, the stone I have set in front of Joshua, there are seven eyes and on that one stone, and I will engrave this inscription on it, The Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin from this land in a single day. In that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under your vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. And so there's this conversation, and the conversation begins, uh, and Satan's there, and uh, Joshua's there, and the angels are there, and, and they're saying, <clears throat> Hey, uh, there's some dirty clothes here, some sinful clothes. Now, <laughs> I can dirty my clothes. I can dirty clothes pretty quickly. I love gardening. I love working in the, in with with trees, with wood, with with all kinds of stuff. I get messy quick, and so there are days that my wife says, "You, I, that those need to go down right now and get washed." Like they can't even sit in the laundry basket. Like they're that dirty. They're that smelly. You you got to go. Uh, Parks has a really keen sense of smell, and he'll say, "Daddy, I smell something." And uh, it's it, there have been times that it's my shorts, and so. Uh, but but this is a little different here. 
He says, you need clean clothes because what you have is sinful. And as I was reading this and praying through this, the thing that popped into my mind is, is Isaiah chapter 6. And, and I'm going to read you here. This is the calling for the, um, this is the calling for, uh, uh, for Isaiah. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I sat, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am, for I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the glory of the Lord Almighty. And one of the seraphim f flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs with the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom should I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. And he said, Go to these people. And then it talks about how he, he, he goes then. And so I thought about that and I thought, man, you know, he says Joshua had unclean clothes on and, and they were sinful clothes. And, and here is Isaiah saying, my, my lips are sinful. How, how, can I, how can I even be the person God needs me to be? And notice in both cases, what happened was God said, man, I got something better. I, I need to purify you. I need to do that for you to be the person that you need to be. And I think that it's important for us, so often we try to do that on our own. We try to, I can just earn enough points to clean it. Uh, watching my small children trying to clean their outfits after they made a mess, especially like with popsicles during the summer, it just drips, or watermelon drips, and they try to, but it's, it's futile. They can't do it on their own. It needs me, and not just me, it, it needs my wife, it needs, it needs the cleaning agent. Sometimes it needs my mom, uh, because she, is, uh, she has all kinds of crazy stuff. To get stains out which is amazing uh, but you look at this and it, we need that we need God to intercede and to take away that sin uh, if we're gonna be the people that God's called us to be uh, and then we are not the high priest and we are not you know it, but God has called us to more God has called us be holy for I am holy it says in in, in first Peter and so we look at this and say, God how can we be holy and 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 that requires God Stepping in and doing what needs to be done there. Now, the other, uh, the other illustration that I thought of when it came to this idea of, of having the right clothes uh, is in Matthew 22. And it says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. But they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted calf have been butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent an army to destroy those murderers and burn their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but I, I've invited those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners, invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out to the street and gathered all the people they could find. The bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed there was a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. He said, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, my friend? And the man was speechless. The king told his attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside in the darkness. Will there be weeping and gnashing of teeth? For many are invited, but few are chosen. And, and the crazy part about this is, the king took the people that wouldn't have naturally been there and said, I want you to be part of this. And God wants for us to be part of his plan. But it's his plan. It's not our plan. And so we can declare it's our right <laughs> to wear what we want to wear. And God says, no, 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 it's not. Like If you're mine, you're mine. If you're here for the party, you're here for the party. You've got to wear the wedding clothes. I was using this example to talk to some, some, some young people just the other day about how we, we don't have that right anymore to say, well, I want to do it. And then God says, no, every day grow closer to me. Every day you are making a choice. You're going closer or away from God. And too often we think of it like, well, maybe I'll just, I'll just choose today not to go real as close to God. But what happens is um, I was playing um, snakes and ladders <laughs> or slides and ladders or whatever you want to call it there um, with, my, with my kids the other day. And, 
And a lot of times we think, well, we'll just go down a little slide. If I'm just going to take a step away. But in reality, some of those slides are long. And we don't know how far when we step away from God, how far we're going to fall. We don't know how what the damage is going to be, what it's going to cost to ourselves or our families or our friends. We don't know that. We need to be very careful when we say, well, I'm just going to do a little bit of sin. I'm just going to, I, I, I. you don't understand. God says, no, no, I, I got more. I, I invited you. I brought you to the wedding. Please, please wear the wedding clothes. And oftentimes they, they would provide those clothes for you. You, you. It's not like you have to do it on your own. We have stuff here. You can't afford it. That's fine. Wear what we brought for you. But some people are, get too full of themselves. And, and, and that's what the, we had in the signboard this week says, you know, if you're not hungry for Christ, it's probably because you're full of yourself. Um, and full of the sin that, that you want to do. And so there's this idea of how can I be hungry for what you have, for, for that righteousness, hunger and thirst for righteousness, for, for they will, you know, be, be filled. And so how can we do that? How can we do that? Um, so the angel came and says uh, in verse 6 and 7 then, you know, I, I, I'm going to give you this charge. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you'll govern my house and have charge over my courts. And I'll give you a place among those standing here. And so it's interesting here, he sets it up here. If, if you do what I'm asking you to do and obey this, then, then I have a job for you. Our obedience is necessary for us to have the job that God has done. If, if we're not obeying, then, then we have no foundation. There, there's, why am I doing what I want to do? I'm doing whatever I want to do. Uh, this is called postmodernism. You do what you want to do, I'll do what I want to do. And we're saying, oh, why can't we all just coexist and get along? We can't because what we're basing our our, our whole paradigm, our, our whole worldview, our whole philosophy, our, our whole actions as a, as a person on is completely different. As a Christian, we need to say, hey, God, what do you have for us and how can I fit in? Instead of saying, well, this is what I want to do. I can put God here, here and here. I think, I think Dad's used that illustration before when it comes to our calendars. Do we lay it out and say, God, what do you have? Or do we say, God, I have some space here and here. If you can fit some things in. That would be great. The mentality needs to be shifted. It needs to be about what you have, God. How can we obey and keep your requirements? That requires us getting to know Him better. Uh, again, I've, I've, I'll say it again: draw near to me, and I draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Uh, James four eight. It's this idea that we have to get closer to God. We have to. Uh, the The sermon here on Sunday was about how we need to spend part of that is prayer. Um, I, I, I mentioned a couple of the things, you know, God doesn't call, you know, he doesn't say, you know, preach without ceasing or, or sing without ceasing or have meetings without ceasing. He says, you know, pray without ceasing. And so what, if, if prayer was our full-time job, would, would we get fired? <laughs> I mean, what would we do? We, we need to be about prayer and we need to be um, consistent with it. Um, the next part, verse 8, says, uh, listen, there's symbolic things to come. I'm going to bring my servant, the branch, and he will remove the sin of this land in a single day. There's a couple other places that mention this idea of branch. Uh, Jeremiah 23 and 33 both uh, talk about that. Um, and Matthew shows that Christ, the branch, as king. And so we have these three places, Matthew, or sorry, Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 33, and Matthew. And they show this idea of the branch, again with a capital B, is Jesus, is the Messiah. Uh, Zechariah 3 shows that uh, Mark is, uh, sorry, and Mark show that Christ, the branch, is a servant of God and man. And so this idea that God is the servant as the branch. Zechariah 6, Luke and Luke show that Christ, the branch, as man, whose job it is to build the church and to become the mediator. Uh, and again, one of the um, one of the commentaries that I had read here talks about Isaiah 4 and says, you know, this shows that Jesus Christ is the branch, but is also God in the flesh. And um, it says, in that day, uh, this is what Isaiah chapter 4 verse 2 says, in that day the branch, again, capital B, of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent, appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. And so, um, you know, last week we talked about Jesus being the cornerstone and, and how, uh, how essential it is for God, for us to build anything we're going to build upon that cornerstone, because that's what keeps us secure. And this week we're looking at, you know, the branch. And Jesus is 
the branch. We are just the part that hangs off the edge of that. Now, John 15 talks a little bit more about this, but right before I go there, uh, you know, Jesus is the branch, and what is he doing in that verse uh, of Isaiah 4, 2? It says, uh, beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be excellent and appealing for those. And so this, this branch is bearing fruit, and that's what he wants us to do. In fact, it says here in John 15, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that does not bear fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like the branch that is thrown away and withered. Such, a branches, such branches are picked up and thrown in the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is my to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that your joy may be, that you may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down his life for one's friends. If you are my friends, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know what his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You do not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that lasts, so that whenever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love one another. And so that's where, that's where we're going to kind of end it, is, is this idea that, that Jesus is the branch. Uh, and, 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 and as the branch remains part of the, the, the vine, that's what enables it to bear the fruit. And so because Jesus was remaining in God, he's able to bear the fruit, which is actually what, what we are. We are the, the fruit of salvation here. And that's what we can be as well. We can be the f- fruit of, uh, well, we the branches that are connected to the vine, which is him. And, and, and those things that he says here, like, I want you to have joy. I want you to have, you know, the, the, the strength here. I want you to be able to remain in me. You, you don't have to, to do the stuff. It's just going like, to flow out of you. You, you. you can't squeeze it out. You can't, you, you can't just hope it out. It, it comes because of we are connected. And so we need to be connected. Uh, we need to be connected at, at church. We need to be connected with God's word. We need to be connected with other Christians. We've got to be connected. And as it says here, we need to love. <laughs> One of the biggest fruits that we're going to bear here is love. Uh, in fact, this is my command. Love each other is the last verse there. And so how are we showing that love um, to the world around us? How are we letting God's love pour through us to the world around? God has so much and he desires for us to be his witnesses. And one of the best ways we can do that is by loving. And again, it's not just like, I care about you, but I care about you because God cares about me. Um, and that's what we need to be be doing. So let's, let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for who you are and the plans you have for us. I thank you that you love us. <laughs> we don't deserve it. I do not deserve it. And yet you do. And I cannot say thank you enough. I ask God that as we are challenged here, commanded here to love others, that we would do just that, to love other people because of your love, with your love. Allow your love to pour through us. I thank you, God, that you have plans for us. And not just plans for us, but the plans of everyone that we come in contact with tomorrow, or even tonight. Help our love to overflow. In your name we pray, amen. Till next week, folks.